So I'm going to talk a bit about high fructose corn syrup. Um, it's derived from cornstarch. It was introduced to the U.S. market around 1970. And there is a relationship. I can't prove this is causal, but as high fructose corn syrup intake increases, obesity and diabetes rates increase. And there's some causal mechanisms that would make that make sense. And it's added to all kinds of things. Soda, candy, canned fruit. Uh, when Dr. Westman was talking about his patient with the pineapple water, um, yeah, I'm afraid that that might have been high fructose corn syrup water or something very related to it. A lot of the canned fruits have you know, sugar added. Uh, fruit has enough sugar without adding any. So there's, there's tons of these. I'm not going to read out all of them, but it's added to all kinds of things, high fructose corn syrup. And fructose is, it, it's special, not in a good way. It's different. It, it gets metabolized different than glucose. Um, every cell in your body can use glucose. Your red blood cells can only use glucose. Most of the other cells can use ketones and, and some tissues I think may even prefer ketones like the brain. But most cells don't take up fructose and, and no cell can use that for energy. They have to do something with it. it. It goes straight to the liver. And the liver, I just mentioned in passing, but fatty liver disease is one of the primary pathologies, one of the primary problems we see as a result of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. Fat you know, gets deposited in the liver, which is unhealthy. You'll see elevated liver enzymes. And then if you get an imaging test, like an ultrasound or a CAT scan, you'll see this fat deposit in the liver. Same thing happens in the pancreas. Fructose is only metabolized by the liver. It goes there. It doesn't suppress ghrelin as much as glucose. It doesn't cause an insulin rise like glucose will immediately. Later it does. Um, and excess fructose ultimately it leads to fatty liver. And uh, Dr. Westerman indicated this as well. But, you know, the, the foie gras, it, people have known this for years. This is a 4,500-year-old piece of art from an Egyptian tomb and it's showing these ancient Egyptians stuffing figs into geese to make fatty liver. And it's described in Roman, ancient Egypt, uh, Greek literature going back thousands of years. Um, so they knew how to make fatty liver this delicacy. And so they took a, ge a goose and they did figs. The second thing, uh, what modern people do usually is corn or some other grain. Um, and you get fatty liver, you get foie gras. And we can do it in humans too, and we do all the time. We take humans and we add a donut or some corn or a big gulp, which is high fructose corn syrup, and we get fatty liver, and it's a disaster. And that's also a huge epidemic that's growing like crazy. Um, real quick on that, it, it, the good news is you can reverse it, and you can reverse it pretty quickly, and a keto diet is, is part of that, but also uh, fasting is a really quick way to address um, who I recommend to patients all the time. I refer people to his website. But you know, this shows the process of glucose increasing insulin and leading to obesity, and then the high insulin levels causing fatty liver and insulin resistance. And that high insulin or hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance kind of feed each other. But fructose can go in directly and cause fatty liver, which is a double whammy. So if you have high glucose and fructose and you get fatty liver, you're really on the track to bad metabolic disease. The fast track, okay. Uh, I think starches, rice, potato, corn, flour, all these things, uh, even a lot of the ones that are healthy, quote unquote, quinoa, healthy whole grains, uh, steel cut oats, these are not bad or evil in themselves, but, but when you start to develop this process of hybrid or insulin resistance, they can be a problem, just the amount and then the response that you get with, with insulin related to that, so excess carbohydrates. Stress. I'm just going to leave this because I've been in the interest of time. I'm going to skip that, but it, it is a significant causal factor. And it's, it's through hormonal mechanisms. That's another thing that I think, um, sorry, I lost my mic, that should, you know, that we should not lose sight of is that for years we've been told in the medical community that this is a, that all these problems are. Uh, an issue with calories. You know, it's, it's you're eating too many calories or you're not burning enough calories and totally disregarding the hormonal aspect of all these problems. And I have patients every day in my clinic who come to me and they're, they're having these metabolic problems and they know why and I know why because they say, well, I was eating a horrible crappy diet and I was eating Snickers and Doritos and that was like the main thing I was eating um, and drinking big gulps. And they're, they're not confused about how they got to where they are. But I have another subset of patients, and there's a lot of them, who come in and say, there must be something hormonal wrong. I want you to check my thyroid. Do you hear this, Dr. Westman? I want you to check my thyroid. It must be my thyroid because 
I feel like what I'm eating is healthy. They're eating the food pyramid. I'm eating six to eight servings of healthy whole grains and a bunch of fruit and vegetable like I've been told to do. And, and they're having all these problems. And, um, and they're right, it's hormonal. It's usually not their thyroid. It's usually insulin and then some of these other hormones, cortisol. Um, so sleep, I'm just gonna, again, skip that. I touched on it briefly, but in the interest of time, because I have a lot to try to share. So again, these are the effects. And, and I think that they're, you know, related, but, but I don't see them like this anymore. I, I see them like that, and I want you to start to see them like that. If you get diagnosed with any of these things around here, and there's others as well, just, if you have a question about this, Google whatever the, the diagnosis is, and insulin resistance or, and hyperinsulinemia, and you'll find connections that you didn't expect, or I certainly did. Uh, so here's a case study. This, this is kind of fun. This guy's name's Michael. He's a 48-year-old, or 43-year-old, excuse me. Um, foreshadowing, he's 48 now. 43-year-old, overweight. Uh, he's a doctor. Question about whether he's tofi or not. It may be a little overweight, but doesn't look really that overweight. 5'10", 196 pounds. Ate the standard American diet for decades. Recent paleo tendencies, this is a few years ago. Um, went to the cardiologist to get a checkup, labs, and a stress test. There, see, so he doesn't look too fat. He might look a little familiar. This is just a few years ago. Um, in that picture, not, not quite as flattering. I, I wasn't afraid to put it up there. But, um, so maybe not Tofi, maybe. But um, here's a lab test that was done a few years ago. And you know, the cholesterol is not too bad. A couple of flags in the cholesterol, which is the top section. But then uh, red on the inflammation marker, the HSCRP that Allie Miller talked about earlier. This is the first time. I, I mean, this patient had ever had that done, and it was high it was a few years ago, and I'm still, you know, I, I, I didn't have an explanation for it. And then there's a kind of a hint down here. A1C test, 5.2, so that's pretty good, because you gotta be 5.6 or higher to be abnormal. Um, but the HOMA IR was high, and I'm gonna show you this, um, again, in the bottom section here. HOMA IR is a calculation that we use glucose and, and the fasting insulin level and calculate. And that's, pretty, that's red, high risk for diabetes. And glucose was 101, and they call that yellow. And I think that should be red too, but that's a pre-diabetic number. And then the insulin level, when fasting, your insulin level really should be low. You, you're, when you're fasting for 12 hours, like I was, a patient was when they went to get these labs, 16 is too high. Um, so this is pre-diabetes. And to go back to the undiagnosed uh, issue from all those pre-diabetics, uh, I don't recall ever being told at my visit or after that you're pre-diabetic, which is interesting. And even, I'll go further to say, I didn't fully recognize the significance of myself a few years ago. But I do now, in my defense. So this patient's pre-diabetic. Um, A1C was normal, so you can't just rely on A1C. It's a useful test to track if you're diabetic. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done as a screening tool, but you shouldn't rely solely on the A1C because you're gonna be, uh, you're gonna be, you know, having hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance and you may be given a false reassurance by an A1C test that's normal. When I started doing glucose tolerance tests more on patients, people don't want to do it because you got to drink this stuff and sit in the lab for two hours. And they're already frustrated enough with the medical system, they don't want to sit in a lab for two hours. But when I started doing those, I, I would find a surprising number of people who had a, you know, a, a normal A1C and Pre, bad prediabetes or even diabetes on uh, two-hour glucose tolerance tests. Dr. Westman, do you ever do those, the glucose tolerance tests? But you're familiar with the phenomenon I'm talking about, right? <clears throat> There's a lot of ways that you can come at that. You can do the, the home IR quickie, these calculations where you use the fasting glucose and insulin. Uh, but I don't recommend just looking for the A1C, which a, a lot of medical providers will, will just do that as they're screening. And then there's this elevated inflammation marker, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what did he do? Um, Keto, low-carb diet, and, and some time-restricted feeding for about a year, lost about 20 pounds, maybe 25, felt better, energy was better. Fasting glucose and insulin decreased to the upper normal. A1C was down to 4.9, which is a good, good number, metabolically healthy, but inflammation markers just stayed high in the three to five range, and optimal is less, you know, less than one. Um, and then went strict keto, and then just from keto and very low-carb to, to zero-carb, that carnivore fad diet, was gonna do it for 30 days, because uh, the patient told him about it, and then has been doing it now for 16 months, and just feeling great. Fasting blood glucose at 80 on the last labs. Insulin was two when fasting, A1C normal. C-reactive protein normal for the first time in five years after going 
zero carb, N not recommending that's necessary for most patients or all, but it's something to just consider and look into. Uh, and he reports feeling like a million dollars, reversed the prediabetes, seasonal allergies went away. That was totally unexpected. Seasonal allergies went away. 35 years of Flonase and Zyrtec um, realized that was totally unnecessary. And there's the recent labs from September of 2019. Glucose is 80. Um, cholesterol is high. And uh, the patient and the doctor are not concerned about that. And <laughs> the HDL and triglycerides are fine. And the C-reactive protein is normal. And insulin is admirably low at two. So, oh, the after pick. I was going to um, show an after pick for that patient whose identity I was trying to protect. <laughs> so, <laughs> next time I give a talk, I'll have an after pick for that patient. Uh, but I'm sorry I don't this time. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm on Instagram, actually, thanks to you, Lindy. Um, okay, I have to catch up a little bit on my notes here, so give me just a minute. So sometimes at this point, when I'm kind of trying to hammer home that point of insulin resistance and high insulin as being a major root cause for all these things, um, you know, people, people will say, well, you're, you're kind of, um, did I skip a, no, okay. So you're, you're kind of hammering insulin. Insulin's not bad. And I agree, insulin is necessary for human life. We have to have insulin. If you don't have insulin, you, that's type 1 diabetes, they can't make any insulin. Uh, and if you don't treat that, you, you die. So you have to have insulin. You want just the right amount. You don't want excess insulin levels that are going to cause all those problems. So it's kind of my Goldilocks theory of hormones. You want just right insulin. Uh, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but you definitely don't want chronically high levels. So what can we do? We recognize that hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance is a causal feature here and that it's a common pathway to a lot of these diseases. Recognize the common hormonal aspect of these diseases. And then control insulin levels. That, that's going to solve a lot of problems, a surprising number of problems. It's not just going to help your weight, although it will. Uh, and there's a lot of options for that. We have a lot of tools. You can do low carb. For some people, that's all they need to do. You can do keto. You can target different carb levels. You can do some intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. You can do zero carb if necessary. You can do some resistance training. That helps sensitize your tissues to insulin. Get good sleep, minimize stress. I barely want to mention this, but sometimes I'm a medical doctor. Sometimes I prescribe medicine for patients. Um, metformin is usually the one that I use if I'm going to prescribe anything for this issue because most of the other medicines that are used to treat diabetes actually make the problem worse, which Dr. Westman, I think, alluded to as well, because they're focused on managing the glucose and, and tracking that glucose number. And what they mostly end up doing is making the insulin levels go higher, even if we're not giving you insulin, which, which we will do that too. Um, the other medicines increase insulin in trying to get the glucose number down, and that's not, it's making the person more insulin resistant, and they gain weight, and they get worse over time, and you have to give them more medicines. So it's a vicious cycle. So, so meds can be used as a last resort, but I have a goal, just like Dr. Westman described too, of de-prescribing, getting people off medicines. I love that. Uh, it's like the favorite part of my day is I say, you don't need this medicine anymore. Um, so we want to lower insulin levels, improve insulin you know, sensitivity. Uh, these are some things that insulin does that are good. So again, I'm not trying to demonize insulin, uh, I, but I am trying to demonize high insulin levels and let us recognize how crucially important that is in the pathology of all this. So there's my Goldilocks. Um, so the standard medical paradigm that I was taught 20 and 25 years ago in medical school and residency was you, you manage, treat, and follow. First you diagnose, but then you manage, treat, and follow these chronic, typically progressive health conditions. But again, um, this is one of the tough parts of that you come to speak at an adaptive event and, and you go up after Dr. Westman. He's kind of stolen my thunder on some of this stuff. But the new paradigm is to reverse these chronic health conditions and put them into remission. That's, that's what I tell my patients is that's the goal, is to say, I used to have diabetes, but now it's in remission. I used to have high blood pressure, but now I don't medicine for it. I just watch my diet. Um, and that's true for a lot of these diseases. And there's a lot of people that are pioneers in that or people that I've learned from that I just mentioned the names, but I'm not going to take time to go into that in the interest of my remaining 15 or so minutes. 
So tools, again, low carbon ketogenic diets are a key tool that I use, uh, and, the, and the idea is lower the insulin levels to target the hyperinsulinemia. Reduce appetite, ketosis does that, decreasing ghrelin. If I have enough time, I might talk about ghrelin for a few minutes. I love that there's a study about that that I love to share with people because um, it talks about the macros and their effect on insulin and glucose and also on ghrelin, this hunger hormone. Uh, and it, it increases insulin sensitivity and causes weight loss. Um, so I start people out with just keep it simple. Keto of 20 grams a day. Total carbs is my preference. I, I know that there are people who get by with doing the net carb thing and they do totally fine and some people don't need to worry about that. But, um, but for some people, net carbs, they get into trouble. They're, they're eating, I find out I'm troubleshooting it. Why am I not you know, having the results I want? And they're eating a lot of packaged or processed foods that have a lot of net carbs and the sources of those are not always good and they may be running into problems with that. So it's a pr common problem I see. So yeah, what are you gonna do? You're gonna eat meat, fish, eggs, high fat dairy for most people, not everybody, but is fine. Natural oils, nuts, low carb veg, that's, that's the basic. Eliminate sugars, especially fructose, because remember it's special, but not in a good way. Grains, starchy carbs, bread, pasta, pizza, all those things, at least at first, I have people either eliminate or radically reduce. Um, not just for their effect on insulin, but again, there's a kind of, some people have an addictive issue with some of these foods. They're getting food reward, they're eating for non, nutritional reasons. And by they, I mean me uh, before, so I'm not pointing out at patients, but um, I, I did that. My thing was savory, it's not sweet. So some people have addictive with sweet things and other people with savory. My thing was savory, but I could eat a whole bag of Doritos or tortilla, you know, eat tortilla chips or that kind of stuff uh, all day. So limit your low carb fruit. If you're gonna have fruit, try to have it low carb. Uh, berries are good. And then in quantity and timing, so seasonally I think is good. There's a, there's a reason that you know, we, um, we didn't you know, get fruit year round. And then root vegetables and starches, again, you might be able to do those, but in limited amounts. I need to see where I'm at on time. Okay, track total carbs. That's, again, I, I call this for some patients, think about the net carb traps. Sometimes you do fine with that, but for other people, it's a place where we need to, we need to say, just start counting the total carbs. Make it simple and start counting the total carbs. Um, consider these things. These are sometimes helpful for some people. Measure for ketosis. Either if that's a goal, if you've got a medical reason that you need to be in ketosis, or when you're starting to see if you're doing it right, or if you get stalled or you're in doubt, you can do urine strips, and increasingly I'm recommending people get blood meters if they're gonna test for ketones. The blood meters are easy, they're inexpensive, it costs like 75 bucks on Amazon, um, and they really give you a good indication. Now, you don't have to do that. People have been doing this for 40 years, or tens of thousands of years uh, without measuring their ketones, but it's an option, and the home glucose meters are really helping a lot of people, the continuous glucose monitors. So track some progress, you can do it on your own, you can do it medically. Um, we track things like, simple things like blood pressure, weight, waste. Um, you can track adipose tissue from various things, a DEXA, which will give you a body composition. And some labs are helpful, and I like to get these as just m some, some markers of your insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance are important. I don't have to get every one of these on every patient, um, but those are, those are useful. And then, uh, you can do intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. You know, these, there's kind of an overlap of all these terms. Um, or time-restricted eating or time-restricted feeding where you're doing a 16-8 or 18-6, meaning 16 or 18 hours a day, you're not eating. You're fasting, you're letting your insulin levels drop. And you're eating in a window. Um, and then I just read a study recently that I found really interesting called ETRF, or that's the abbreviation for it, early time-restricted feeding. And the idea there was that there are hormonal reasons that if you're gonna spend you know, 16 or 18 hours fasting and six or eight hours eating, to put it into the first half of the day, which is not what I had fallen into myself when I was doing that uh, or recommended to patients. A lot of people would do like 11 or noon to seven or eight or something like that. Um, but this study was really interesting where they, they did that and um, this is the, the brief version of that is, you know, normally, regular eating pattern is 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. ish. We're gonna eat 12 hours a day. And this early time restricted feeding, it was really interesting. They, they had them eat just from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. They had five weeks of doing this and then they crossed over to the other group. And they ate exactly the same things. And in this, they weren't even eating, you know, low carb or ketogenic diet. Um, and they saw tons of benefit from just restricting their time of eating to those hours. 
uh, their postprandial or after eating insulin levels dropped, their insulin sensitivity went up, their beta cell, which is the pancreas function, went up, their blood pressure went down, oxidative stress went down, appetite in the evening went down. The only sort of possibly negative is the triglycerides, which is a bad type of cholesterol, went up. But it was, that was really powerful. And you know, here's what they did. So again, the, the control group is what you would normally do, 33% of your, and they, they kind of, it's a little arbitrary, but a third of the calories in each of those. They had them do the exact same amount of calorie and exact same amount of foods, uh, but just in, a, in an eight hour window. And just to show you, this was, again, they got all those benefits. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. They got all those benefits and these are the things they're eating. So if you just look at some of those, um, they're not low carb foods. Whole, whole, whole wheat bread, hamburger bun, you know, there's a lot of things on there that uh, I wouldn't recommend if somebody's trying to do keto or low carb, but they got a lot of benefits just, just from time restricting.